This is Dallas, the city, on what would appear to be a normal fall weekend. In the many parks, the leaves are falling. Christmas decorations are already up on the downtown streets, although we've yet to enjoy our Thanksgiving dinner. Football is in the air, of course. Last night, Saturday night, many Dallasites were on the town, as usual. This Sunday morning, many attended the church of their choice, as usual. A normal fall weekend for Dallas, you say? No, not quite. For the date is November 22nd, and Dallas is haunted by memories today. Memories of another weekend which began just a year ago today. I'm Bob Gooding, and the memories of that other weekend are particularly vivid to the men you're about to meet, for they lived this story. Some of the faces will be familiar, men in public life, faces from your television screen. But others will be those of WFAA executives, and the cameramen, the editors, the writers of the WFAA news staff. Here at Communication Center, the newsroom is usually busy. But a year ago today, with a presidential visit, John Allen was left to make a momentous decision alone. This is the desk where I had been seated for about half an hour, working on the 1255 radio newscast. As I typed, I listened to comments on the police radio. Remarks had been made about people stepping from the curb who might uh, move into the center of the street and block the presidential motorcade as it approached the downtown Dallas area, and policemen had been dispatched to clear the streets. And then suddenly, from the police radio, I heard this report. After hearing that report from the police radio, I first considered confirming what I'd heard with the police dispatcher by telephone, but decided against it because of the probability that their switchboard would be jammed. I then turned to the typewriter and quickly typed this bulletin. Three shots were reportedly fired at the presidential motorcade at Elm and Houston as it passed through downtown Dallas. Then I turned and stepped into the news announce booth and put that bulletin on the air. The time was approximately 30 seconds past 12.30 when the bulletin was aired. And so it was that at 30 seconds past 12.30 on November 22nd, 1963, that John Allen broadcast the first word of that tragic event. Where did it all begin? Millions of words have been written on this subject. We can safely say that it began for us the night before in Fort Worth. WFAA's Fred Hatton was there then. Let's go to him there now. This is Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas. Carswell today is a combat-ready B-52 base of the Strategic Air Command. And it was here, on that cold night of November 21st, where President John F. Kennedy first arrived for a scheduled two-day visit in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. More than a hundred of the local news media, cameramen, and reporters stood here inside the flight line, chafing under tight security measures taken by the Secret Service. And we complained that the President was being overly protected from the very people who would do him no physical harm. We were confined to a small roped-in area where night photography of the president from a distance would be difficult if not. A large crowd had gathered here and had waited several hours impatiently, but not unruly, for the arrival of the president. They were very much alive that night and warm, the President and Mrs. Kennedy, and were visibly pleased by the tremendous ovation given them by the crowd of several thousand persons. And after only a brief meeting with local dignitaries, the President took a radiant Jacqueline by the hand and they abandoned caution, walking directly into the welcoming arms of the multitude. Then they were gone as the motorcade moved toward downtown Fort Worth. And so President Kennedy approached the end of a busy day in his swing through Texas, a trip which was proving most successful from both a personal and a political point of view. The destination now, Fort Worth's Hotel, Texas, 
But here were more crowds waiting to have their look at the president and his first lady, the lovely Jacqueline Kennedy. All but lost in the crowd were Texas Governor Connolly and the then Vice President Lyndon Johnson. President Kennedy did not disappoint those who waited. And then finally into the Hotel Texas for the night. And so ended that Thursday night, November 21st, 1963. A light rain fell during the night. The morning was cloudy. A drizzle continued to fall. Today was to be the big day in Dallas. But before that, Fort Worth was to play host. Ray John was waiting outside the hotel long before the president arose. He has that story now. I'm standing on a parking lot in the middle of downtown Fort Worth. Right behind me is the 8th Street entrance to the Hotel Texas. One year ago, the marquee on this hotel read, Welcome, Mr. President. After a night's rest in the presidential suite at the hotel, Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, began as had many other days in the past for President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Out here on the parking lot, Crowds estimated in the tens of thousands gathered for just a glimpse of their president. Many had waited throughout the night, even though a light rain was falling. Instead of going to the speaker's platform, the president headed into the crowds, into the ranks of waiting citizens. I was fortunate enough to be pushed along with the presidential entourage, hearing the many people express their pleasure and delight and happiness at just having touched or having shook his hand. At one point, the crowds became so enthusiastic, they pushed down the restraining barriers that were holding them back. After a few minutes, the president left the crowds and went to the speaker's platform where he delivered a short but very energetic speech. One of the members of the Kennedy presidential party on this swing through Texas was an old friend of the president, Congressman Jim Wright of Fort Worth. We asked Congressman Wright for his thoughts in retrospect. Well, that day, uh, November 22nd of 1963, seems uh, in some ways almost an eternity ago. It seems almost unreal. I suppose that was the most traumatic experience that any of us in this nation and our generation can recall. It was particularly poignant to those of us who had been with the president on those preceding days and hours when he was so buoyant, so vibrant, so happy, sharing himself so unrestrainedly with his people. That morning uh, dawned in Fort Worth and I suppose it was impossible for any of us who were with him to feel other than that the nation and uh, this man who so perfectly symbolized it were uh, in their finest hour. He spoke to a group outside the Texas Hotel and had trouble pulling himself away to go inside to make a speech to a breakfast crowd that was there. I uh, remembered almost whimsically the Lines of his uh, favorite poem, The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep. Miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. But there were no thoughts of sleep that morning in Fort Worth. The president took time to change into a dry coat and arrived in the grand ballroom of the Hotel Texas to receive a standing and thundering ovation.
Veteran reporters could recall no warmer welcome given a chief executive than these receptions in Texas. But there was something lacking, the first lady. As the president told an intimate that morning, her entrance was deliberately delayed so that she too would have her moment in the spotlight. She could not have been disappointed, for after the suspense had been built up, the happy breakfast throng reacted to their first sight of Jacqueline Kennedy on Texas soil with the same enthusiasm they had demonstrated in welcoming the president. President Kennedy spoke of this. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. Then the never-ending schedule of the chief executive continued. On tap for this day, a trip to Dallas, a luncheon speech, then to Austin for a reception and speech at a Democratic fundraising dinner. From Austin, the president and Mrs. Kennedy were to be the guests of the vice president at the LBJ Ranch. But the president of the United States is never off stage. Crowds lined the route wherever he traveled. And along with Air Force One, there was another large crowd waiting at Carswell Air Force Base. Accompanying the president to Carswell was the man who had served as master of ceremonies at the presidential breakfast, Fort Worth civic leader, Mr. Raymond Buck. You uh, will never know the great sense of uh, pride and happiness that we had in Fort Worth uh, from the visit of President and Mrs. Kennedy, the Vice President and Mrs. Johnson. We had given uh, the President uh, and Mrs. Kennedy a pair of boots, Texas boots made in Fort Worth, and uh, when we uh, said goodbye to them at the airplane on their way to Dallas, they both said that uh, they would be wearing those boots uh, the next morning down on Vice President Johnson's LBJ Ranch. When the door of the airplane was closed, uh, we felt that it was closing on one of the happiest uh, and proudest occasions that Fort Worth had ever witnessed. And now it became the pleasant duty of Dallas to play host to the President of the United States. Presidential tours are run on a rigid time schedule. The Presidential Party and the Secret Service men have their own communications network, which allows them the opportunity to notify the next stop on the route when to expect the President. Allowances are made for the time spent with the crowds, such as the one at Carswell. And so the party was fairly well on schedule. The trip from Carswell to Dallas Love Field was accomplished in some eight minutes by the flying White House Air Force One. Our video cruiser, a self-contained broadcasting plant, was waiting. Here's Bob Walker with that story. In the past year, there's been a lot of traffic here at busy Love Field in Dallas. A lot of traffic right here at the International Arrivals Gate. But I remember one morning a year ago today in which traffic stood still. It didn't appear to start out that way, although when I got out here at 8 o'clock in the morning, it was a dark, dreary, dismal morning. A lot of rain had been coming down, enough to make it a real nasty type day. Crowds started to form out here awaiting the president's arrival about 9 o'clock in the morning. They were all behind this fence here, out of the grounds, behind the arrivals building. And as the hour grew near for the president's arrival, the crowd started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Air Force One came down about 11.37. By that time, there were several thousand people here. There were policemen everywhere, but they had little to do, for the crowds were friendly and effectively confined behind these wire fences. These were people who had come to Love Field on what had looked to be a rainy, dismal morning for a look at their president. And many, I suspect, had come to see Jackie Kennedy. Well, finally, the moment came. The President and First Lady stepped out onto the ramp of Air Force One. I remember my first impression was of a tan, Mr. President. If you'll recall, he had just spent several days in Florida. Well, they went about the business of protocol, greeting the reception committee from Dallas. There was then Mayor Earl Cavill, 
Mrs. Campbell presented two dozen roses to the First Lady. Eric Johnson, who was later to succeed Mr. Campbell as mayor, was a member of that committee. Dr. Lloyd Berkner, president of the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest, the host organization for the luncheon, shook hands with the president. And then protocol, out of the way, the president came to the people. In a move which I realized must have given the Secret Service men pause, he came to the fence to shake hands with every hand he could reach. From my vantage point, he seemed to be saying over and over, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No man could have been happier with this reception. Actually, he threw his time schedule off for his trip, delaying as long as possible with these people. But then it was time to leave. At the moment the sun had burst through the clouds, the orders had been issued to remove the plastic bubble from the limousine. The president and first lady were joined in the back by Governor and Mrs. Conley. None of us dreamed of what was in store for the world just 40 minutes from that moment. As mayor of Dallas at that time, Congressman-elect Earl Cabell greeted the president on behalf of the city. We asked him for thoughts in retrospect. All of the omens that day were wonderful. Uh, just as the president and Mrs. Kennedy stepped off of Air Force One, the sun broke through the clouds. Uh, it was certainly the pleasure of Mrs. Cabell and me to greet them, for Mrs. Cabell to give her the bouquet of two dozen roses. And it was a very joyous occasion. And then uh, all through the motorcade, the some eight or nine miles that we traveled, the enthusiasm of the people was so contagious and there was uh, so many cheers and so much warmth in the entire welcome that uh, certainly there was nothing to indicate the tragedy that would strike uh, within a few minutes uh, after we had made the remark that nowhere uh, on the president's trip, uh, rather Congressman Roberts made the remark to us that nowhere on the president's trip had he received such an enthusiastic welcome uh, along the entire course of the motorcade. One of our men was riding in that motorcade. Others covered it from along the route. Let's hear now from Roger Reddy, somewhere along the route of that presidential motorcade. I remember vividly my first and last look at President Kennedy in person a year ago today. From this vantage point here on Lemon Avenue in front of a small shopping center, the president's motorcade approached from behind me down Lemon Avenue from Love Field. Moments before that, we had all stood out here, throngs and throngs of people lining both sides of Lemon Avenue, watching Air Force One glide right to its landing down its flight path above Lemon Avenue, just a couple of hundred feet above us. Then, moments later, the motorcade came into view directly behind me. The people, as I said, thronged on both sides of the street. They were a happy crowd, an eager crowd to see President Kennedy. As the motorcade approached slowly down Lemon Avenue, we could see that President Kennedy was laughing and chatting with Mrs. Kennedy, the people in the car, Governor and Mrs. Connolly. They were happy. The president looked wonderful. We remember remarking to people here how tanned he looked, how happy he looked, how apparently uh, enthused he was about the reception being given him here at Dallas. Mrs. Kennedy was radiant in her pink outfit, a big smile on her face. President Kennedy leaned over to Mrs. Kennedy and made some remark which elicited a chuckle and a big smile uh, from her face. Then they passed down the way here and about 200 yards further down Lemon Avenue where the street narrows, the motorcade had to stop momentarily because of the huge crowd of people in the street. They had to push those people back in order for the motorcade to proceed. It was a wonderful experience seeing the President and Mrs. Kennedy so happy moments before the tragedy. As the motorcade approached the downtown Dallas area, the crowds multiplied and, if possible, became more enthusiastic. WFAA-TV's program director, Jay Watson, with Jerry Haynes, witnessed the passing of the motorcade from its last block on Houston Street. Let's go to them now, one year later. Jay, as I recall, it was just about this kind of day a year ago. To the hour, almost, don't you think? Exactly to the hour. I think that the day was a little bit cooler. I know that when we walked up here on a lunch break, 
Uh, we walked up, we stood first of all down at the corner, and then something, uh, a fella had a, a seizure. Yes, uh, and the ambulance came to take him away. Uh, so we moved down approximately straight across to the entrance to the county jail there, and the president came by, and I remember particularly he waved. Yes, know, well, I remember you had your hands up and you clapped, uh, you know, applauding him, and he looked over in our direction. And I remember I was uh, impressed by uh, having never seen him in person before, his size and also Mrs. Kennedy. Our man in the motorcade was photographer Mal Couch riding in the official press car. He picks up the story now, speaking in Chicago. As we turned the fateful corner, our senses were numbed and our hearts seemed to stop beating as we heard the shots ring out. It was a photographer from Dallas who slammed his elbow into my right side and yell, look up in the window, there's the rifle. And straight in front of us, we could see the Texas School Book Depository Building. And almost to the top floor, there was a gleaming gun barrel sticking out of the window. The next few seconds were frantic. People were running, people were screaming, people were falling to the ground. I took quick pictures of the maddening scene, policemen running. And then I thumbed my way out to Parkland Hospital. I just knew that they would take the president to Parkland. Mal Couch's hunch proved to be correct. The motorcade raced for Parkland Hospital. And not far behind was Bert Schiff. Here at the rear of Parkland Hospital, where a majority of Dallas County's emergency cases come in, was written chapter two in one of the most unbelievable and tragic murder stories ever given a newsman to cover. Usually, an ambulance will come in here without too much fanfare. There's not much confusion right now, but this wasn't true a year ago today. I was at the trademark when I learned that the presidential motorcade had passed and something had gone amiss. I commandeered a ride with a private detective, and as we came to this, this area here, there was a, everyone was in a state of what I might describe now as stunned confusion. The presidential party was the one that was most confused as they walked around here uh, aimlessly, not knowing what to do. Among those I remember was Senator Ralph Yarbrough and Representative Jim Wright from Fort Worth, who uttered scrambled phrases of disbelief as they wandered around aimlessly with feeling of complete uselessness. The, uh, as I filmed bits and snatches of the stunned scene here, I recall that my camera came to focus on the face of Police Chief Jess Curry, who appeared to be fighting back tears as thoughts of that'll probably never be put on paper whirled through his mind. I felt a lot of compassion for this man because he appeared, as I looked in his eyes, to have the worries of the world on his shoulders. I've hurriedly filmed as much of the activities outside as I could and went inside to learn more of the president's condition, which was not known at this time. Also, I want to check on a rumor that President, now President Lyndon Johnson had been seen entering the emergency room somewhat stooped over with his hand over his heart. And also, we didn't know the condition of the wounded Governor Conley. When I went inside, I found lots of phones busy and reporters like Merriman Smith defending them almost with their lives. He promised me that I'd get more than the operator if I tried to take his away from him. I found one near, somewhere near the back part of the emergency room, and as I was calling the station, a friend of mine who was, I'll say, in a position to know uh, passed by, and he was, had the shocked look on his face, and I asked him what are the chances for the president, and he told me he had no chance at all. He had no chance at all. But only at Parkland was this known. Let us turn back the clock to the moment of the shots and pick up the story of Jay Watson and Jerry Haynes. Let's see, then if I remember, we turned to walk away when he got to the corner and started making the turn. And then we heard the first shot. Yes, we were just about right down here at the corner yeah. when the first right shot the came. sidewalk. And um, we stopped. Yes. And then the shot, the second shot. That was when you said, my gosh, that's gunfire. I said, my God, they're shooting at yes. us. And we turned around to the right here behind and on the mall or whatever you'd call it on the grass and could see the confusion raining and we ran around to the side and... I think uh, the Kennedy car had already gone. The black car was just there. taking under the viaduct. We were just uh, going under the viaduct there whenever we looked up. Yes. I remember the car zigzagging and as it took off. We ran around and I grabbed... Let's see, we grabbed... Uh, a lady and her two children and her husband, and they were, the reason it impressed me to grab them, first of all, is because she was, uh, they were laying on top of the kids, and I started yelling to everybody, come on over to Channel 8. Uh, and I had run back to the station. You went back to the station to get the, the crew ready, and I took the lady, 
and we commandeered a car right here on the corner. There were two traveling salesmen there, and the back of their car had a multitude of things in it, and I pushed the people in and said to them, the president has been shot, take us to Channel 8, and he did. He wheeled around over there, got into the station, and you had had part of the crew set up, but we couldn't convince an interesting thing. And uh, we couldn't convince our crew that the president had been shot. Well, we had known it had happened, and I checked the uh, United Press and Associated Press yeah. wires, and it's interesting, when you are there when it happens, how little the rest of the world knows that yeah. you must begin the uh, information. That's right. uh, even though it's, well, let's see, this is the first time you, we've been back down here. Yes, it sure is. A year ago today, but I, I go this way every time as I go home from work, and it's still like that day at given times, according, I guess, to what kind of mood I'm in. But anyway, we got back to the station, and the lady, uh, we went on the air as soon as we could for the interview with her as an eyewitness. We were standing next to the curb so the children could see the president, and the car was just up a piece from us, and this shot fired out, and I thought it was a firecracker. And the president kind of raised up in his seat, and uh, I thought, you know, he was kind of going along with a gag or something. And then all of a sudden, this next one popped, and Governor Conley grabbed his stomach and kind of laid over to the side. And then another one, it was just all so fast, and President Kennedy reached up and grabbed, looked like he grabbed his ear, and blood just started gushing out. And uh, my husband said, quick, get down. And I grabbed the baby, and we ran and laid down on the grass, and I got on top of him. It was just, just right by us when it all happened, just right in front of us. It, was, it, it happened so fast that you didn't have a chance to, to see anything. It, it just was too fast. All but forgotten in these frantic moments were the guests at the trademark. They were isolated even from events immediately outside the large auditorium. Here, the uninvited waited for a glimpse of the president. Some carried signs. Not all of the signs were of the welcome variety. In fact, police hustled several such pickets away from the vicinity. Travis Lynn was inside then. Let's go to him there now. A year ago, 2,500 people were here in the trade mart rather excitedly awaiting the arrival of President Kennedy. Most of us wanted eagerly to see Mrs. Kennedy, who was visiting Dallas and Texas for the first time. At 12.30 exactly, I had just gone on the air to describe the arrival which I expected would be imminent. Only two minutes later, I learned that something had happened, shots had been fired at the president, but only the press up here in the press box was aware of that. Word seeped through to those on the floor of the hall in other ways. WFAA's general manager, Mike Shapiro, and television manager, Ed Pfeiffer, were among the invited guests that day. They're here now. It was an exciting day, Mike. Uh, I recall the mood of all of the people around us as we sat here at the trademark, uh, a mood of anticipation, of excitement. Well, uh, this was certainly true, and uh, I think there was a little uh, excitement to get the thing underway when uh, when uh, all the tables had been served, the salad, I think we were debating as to whether to start or not. When uh, I noticed this group about over in this section over in here of uh, some of the arrangements committee, if you remember, Ed, and I was curious as to what was going on, I went up and talked to them, and I had heard for the first time that uh, our president had been shot. It was completely in disbelief and in shock. I thought they were being very uh, crude and uh, joking way, and I found out it was serious. And if you remember, I came back to the table and told you. I recall one thing in particular. You're indicating to me that the, uh, that there was a rumor mm -hmm. uh, concerning the shooting of a president or of the president, and then uh, it struck me as it probably struck you. Well, if the president had in fact uh, 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 experienced such a thing, that uh, it would hardly be something that we could keep a secret for very long. Well, we couldn't keep it a secret. As I say, I think it was total disbelief on both of our parts. But after we saw some of the Secret Service men running down uh, the side of the trademark here, it automatically hit both of us, I think, at the same time that we're in the communications business and we better get back to the station. Yes, I recall in particular uh, uh, the moment, and the moment seemed to go so fast at that particular point, when uh, suddenly uh, I looked around and, and there were ladies uh, at, at the next table who were in tears uh, of, uh, of 
oh, a matter of grave concern on, on, on most of the men's faces, and it struck me that it, it, it must have some... And after we had dashed from the tables along the side, we saw some of the waiters with a transistor radio, and we heard it on the radio right. for the first time. We dashed out to my car, we turned on our radio to listen to the station, and we were getting the reports, and we still didn't believe it. About 25 minutes after that, the announcement was made that President Kennedy had been shot. His condition, they said, was unknown, although actually he'd already been pronounced dead. Dr. Luther Holcomb led a prayer asking for Kennedy's health, and the luncheon was dismissed. It was at that time that the Negro waiter, smartly dressed, who had been assigned to serve President Kennedy, leaned his head against the presidential seal on the rostrum and began to cry. And on my way out in that strange atmosphere of November 22, 1963, I noticed a young man carrying one of the yellow roses, which had decorated the tables, apparently as a souvenir of that day. Today, the trademark is quiet. The men go about their business of commerce. A few people are gathered at the tables. Outside, there's a memorial marking that day and the flagpole, which was erected especially for the president. Dr. Lloyd Berkner is president of the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest, one of the host organizations for the trademark luncheon. We asked him for his thoughts in retrospect. I cannot, of course, forget the date, November 22, 1963. One could only wish that the tragic events of that date could be erased from American history. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was a guest of our city, of our state, of our region, and indeed of our center. The day started as a very happy one with clearing weather. Both President Kennedy and Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson spoke to me warmly of the scientific and the educational goals of our center and of our region as they came from the presidential plane. President Kennedy had prepared a major national and international address. His first words were to have been about the Graduate Research Center and its place in the development of the social fabric of our nation. And I would record his never spoken words. He said, and I quote, it is not a coincidence that those communities possessing the best in research and graduate facilities tend to attract new and growing industries. I congratulate those of you here in Dallas who have recognized these basic facts through the creation of the unique and forward-looking Graduate Research Center. President Kennedy went on to say the link between the leadership and learning is not only essential at the community level, it is even more indispensable in world affairs. Ignorance and misinformation can handicap the progress of a city or of a company, but they can, if allowed to prevail in foreign policy, handicap this country's security in a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason. Thank you, Dr. Berkner. And now once again, let's toy with time. Let's set the clock back once more to that fateful minute of 12.30 in the afternoon. The scene of the assassination was still in a state of shock. Some individuals verged on panic. No one knew what had happened or what was happening, but instinctively, those with jobs to do went about them. In seconds, attention had focused on one building. Tom Aye was a part of that story. Behind me is the famed Texas School Book Depository. No cameramen are allowed in this building today, but a year ago, I was able to enter this building along with the Secret Service and shoot exclusive footage of finding of the assassin's gun, dusting it for fingerprints. It was by accident, actually, that I arrived upon the scene. I was coming back from Fort Worth after having filmed the president in his last speech, his last breakfast, his last cup of coffee. And coming back to the station, just a few feet in front of me, we heard on the radio, all units, Code 3, Parkland Hospital. Immediately following that was the word that shots had been fired at the president. They gave the helm and Houston as the location. I jumped out of the unit, grabbed a barred camera, mine had uh, developed a malfunction, an extra 400 feet of film and raced to the scene. This was the scene, the school book depository. 
Everyone at that time was looking around. I saw a couple of gentlemen pointing up the stairs to one of the top four windows. I assumed that the assassin probably could still be in the building. At that time, we did not know that there was an assassin, only that two shots had been fired. I raced into the building. About the same time, the Secret Service, the FBI, and other law enforcement units, we hit the door at the same time. Several witnesses had reported seeing a rifle in a window near the top of the building. And here it was found. But officers searched every inch of the floor, around, over, and behind cases of books. Found one rifle, missing the suspect, but missing only for a short period of time. Ron Ryland continues the story from Oak Cliff. This is the Texas Theater one year later. This was the beginning of the end for Lee Harvey Oswald. For me, the beginning was at the Texas Book Depository. First thing I knew about the assassination when came across police radio that shots had been fired. Instinctively, I raced for the Texas Book Depository, ran into the building with Secret Service agents. We went up to several of the floors. We were on about the fifth floor when one of the men raced up to us and said there's been a shooting of an officer in Oak Cliff. We raced out of the building, jumped into our unit that was parked at the curb. We went to 10th Street here in Oak Cliff. An officer had been shot. The crime lab was here investigating officers, witnesses. And this was the first that we knew that the officer was J.D. Tippett. Another person ran up to us at this point and said he has run into an old building down the street, a building that was used to house antiques. Officer Hill and several others ran into the front of the building with drawn pistols. I ran around the back of the building with my camera in hopes that if they flushed this man that we were looking for, he would come out the back door right into the face of the camera. At this point, we found a gray jacket that once again this unknown man had abandoned. At this point, we once again jumped into our units following a whole group of police cars that went racing over towards Jefferson Avenue to a public library. At the library, once again, our police radios said that the man that we were seeking had run into the Texas theater. We dashed down to the Texas theater, ran into the building. Someone standing at the foot of the stairs says, your man is upstairs. We raced upstairs, but at this time the house lights came on and the balcony was completely empty. We raced down to the first floor of the theater. There was a man sitting about three rows from the back of the theater. He jumped up, crazily waved a pistol at us and shouted, this is it. Officer Hill, McDonald, others jumped him and quickly manacled the man and hustled him out through these doors to a squad car that was waiting at the curb. This was the first time that anyone had even mentioned that this man was possibly tied in with the assassination. The crowd standing around in front hollered, kill him, hang this man. They hustled him away, turning the corner for City Hall. City Hall in Dallas plays an increasingly important role in the story of that weekend. As Lee Harvey Oswald was raced to City Hall in a police car, Charles Butt was on his way to intercept. This is the basement of the Dallas City Hall. Behind me is the booking office. All police arrests are brought through here. Complaints are sworn against them. Charges are filed. Their personal belongings are accounted. And from here, they're taken upstairs for further processing. I don't believe I'll ever walk through this room, but I don't remember a day just one year ago when Lee Harvey Oswald came through. I was waiting just outside the door to try to get what pictures I could of him. He was being brought in from the Texas Theater. About all I remember of Oswald as he came through here was just a fleeting glimpse in the viewfinder of my camera. I was surrounded by a half a dozen or so police officers and detectives. As soon as he came through, my first impulse was to dash for an elevator to try to get upstairs before he did. I followed him into the uh, door of the homicide and robbery office, one of three newsreel cameramen to make that trip. I got a few pictures of him inside the interrogation room and uh, they had the pistol that he had used uh, to try to shoot one police officer. They thought he had shot another one, and he was also a suspect at that time in the assassination of President Kennedy. But nobody really knew anything for sure about him right then. It was just a scene of confusion. I've never seen anything quite like it in my life. Nobody could really say who had done what or when or anything else, and it, everybody was just trying to find out, the police, reporters, and everybody.
Meanwhile, at Parkland Hospital, the dreaded word came. The president was pronounced dead at 1 p.m. At that moment, our video cruiser was on its way to Parkland Hospital. And for that story, here is WFAA production manager Jim Pratt with chief announcer Ed Hogan. After the uh, president left on his motorcade, Ed, we went off to lunch, and it was at lunch that we got the word that the president was shot. And run, we remember running back to the cruiser, and uh, we were trying to find out what, uh, what to do, and decided to go over to Parkland Hospital where they'd taken the president's body. And getting into the hospital was something else again, because uh, I recall there were a lot of people standing around, and there were a lot of cars. Quite a few hundred. Yeah, quite a lot of people. And, um, and I asked the policeman if we could drive in, and he says, there's no place to park. And I said, well, if I can find a place to park and I get in, and he said, by all means. So we drove right over the curb and onto the grass and parked right next to a keep off the grass sign. And it was shortly after that that you came along, and I was happy to see you because we just had an instance where um, the uh, hearse had driven by with the president's body. Which no one was sure of at that point, I That's believe. That's true. Uh -huh. Still didn't really know. And then... Uh, I'm sure you won't ever forget some of the expressions on faces, really expressionless faces, of people standing there, and actually not spectators or curiosity seekers, but people simply coming there to pay uh, homage and last respects to their president. That's true. And uh, then, of course, uh, later we went to, um, well, we got a lot of interviews here at the hospital, I recall, uh, with the doctors and such. Right, and after that, we went conference. We went to um, the city hall and spent a few days, didn't we, Ed? We certainly did, Jim. Some of the longest days, I guess, of our uh, of our lifetime. I suppose. I hope that uh, it never reoccurs. And I, I do remember, Jim, that uh, the gasoline uh, service man that came up uh, just to go along with how people were just walking around, kind of in a daze, and he filled up the uh, cruiser here with gasoline and filled it up a little bit too much, and it gasoline was running down the, curb. down the curb, and people were walking by, and we were a little. Uh, alerted then to we had to call out the fire department to get them to come out and wash down the street i found one thing ed uh finding now that as emotional as we are i think that's as close as i ever want to get to history how about you me too jim when the death of president kennedy was officially announced lyndon johnson was smuggled out of parkland hospital toward an unknown destination by the secret service there was a rumor to the effect that he would not be sworn in until he arrived in washington then the word came that he would take the oath of office at Love Field. Art Sinclair has that part of the story. A Mexicana Airlines plane is loading in the background at this moment. A year ago today, two planes were parked in this general area, Air Force One and Air Force Two. While riding in a mobile unit, the call came out for any unit on the air to proceed to Love Field, that the President of the United States was to be sworn in momentarily here at Love Field. As we proceeded immediately here to this spot, we tried to get in, and a policeman standing at a nearby gate would not let us in because we did not have a presidential pass. We argued with him momentarily, but he would not let us in, although he let some other people in who had passes. He didn't know. They did not have photographs. As we stood there, somewhat frustrated, trying to get out onto Love Field, the president's plane began to taxi down the runway. And as it lifted off, we suddenly discovered that the plane was to go and that there would be no swearing in ceremonies. A few seconds later, we learned that the President of the United States had been sworn in while we stood at Love Field's gate. And so the new President of the United States was sworn in on his native soil of Texas before winging his way to Washington on the same plane which carried the body of his predecessor. Mayor Cabell had a comment in retrospect. I think that if there's any one lesson to be learned, it is that this is a great country, it's a stable country, our people are stable. And despite that tragedy, despite the grief, our government was able to pick up the reins. There were men standing by, ready, trained, capable. And therefore, the, the course of the government, the course of our nation, uh, didn't falter, but continued the progress uh, that is so typical of the, this great nation of ours. But this bizarre tragedy had yet to run its course. By now, Dallas was the center of world attention. The crush of the national and international press was stifling on city officials. Center of this attention was the third floor corridor at City Hall. Vic Robertson was there. He's there now. 
A year ago, this hall was in unbelievable bedlam. It was the night that Lee Harvey Oswald was being interrogated in the homicide offices by Captain Will Fritz. The president had just been assassinated. Immediately over my right shoulder, down the hall, on the left side of the hall, as you look at your screen, is the office of homicide captain Will Fritz. Behind that door, Lee Harvey Oswald, members of the Secret Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Dallas Police Department were all congregated with officers on guard at the door. Now, further on down the hall on the other side of the water cooler is the door to the elevator which leads upstairs to the jail. Oswald made several trips back and forth down that short expanse of hall, but it was a very difficult passage because this hall at that particular time was jammed almost solid with human bodies, most of whom were reporters, but included occasionally Jack Ruby, the man who was in turn to kill Lee Harvey Oswald. Yes, even Jack Ruby. And when the crush became too much for the third floor, this impromptu press conference with Lee Harvey Oswald was moved to the assembly room. Still cramped quarters. A defiant Lee Oswald went to bed that night with the press corps believing that he'd be transferred to the county jail on Saturday. WFAA Radio News Director Tom Perriman waited there. Behind me is the 100 block of North Houston Street, the last block of President Kennedy's motorcade. To my right, about 100 yards, is the Texas School Book Depository. And to my back is the county courthouse, the entrance to the jail you can see. Much has happened in the past year in this county courthouse, the most spectacular being that trial of Jack Ruby. He's still up there awaiting his fate at this time. One year ago on the Saturday after President Kennedy had been shot, about 60 or 70 reporters were here ready for the transfer of Lee Harvey Oswald to the county jail facilities. We found out late Saturday afternoon that the transfer would not come Saturday. Likely it would come on Sunday morning. So Sunday morning we returned, about 60 or 70 strong. But as the world knows, that transfer was never to be completed. Our man in the City Hall basement that Sunday morning was Bob Thornton. A year later, he's there again. This is the basement of the Dallas Police Department. On a normal day, and especially on a weekend, it's a beehive of activity with police bringing prisoners in and out from various parts of the city. To my left is a large parking area, and back to my right is the police booking room where prisoners are booked before being carried up to the jail. About a year ago, I was stationed in this area along with a number of other reporters waiting for Lee Harvey Oswald to be transferred to the county jail. I remember there was quite a bit of hustle and bustle of activity as Police moved uh, about in the area checking security. I myself had walked in earlier without an ID card, but I think that's possibly because I had been in the police station numerous times throughout the weekend. But I did mention to another reporter that it would be easy for someone to slip into the basement, and he said no, that he didn't think there was a chance with the extra security precautions. Then the police tried to back a huge armored car into the basement. They were unable to do so because of its size. Next, uh, several police squad cars began moving about in the basement. One of them made an exit on the north ramp leading into the basement where we learned later that Jack Ruby walked in. Another one positioned itself behind the armored car. And a last minute television camera was rolled into place. The reporters were asked to stand to the far side of the ramp to give the police room to maneuver. I positioned myself in an area where Oswald would have to pass by and I had hoped to get a statement from him. But that was not to be. We know now that every foot down the elevator shaft, every foot across the police booking room that Lee Harvey Oswald moved would lead him closer to his death. Thank you. Can't tell you. Hey, officer, officer. officer. Yeah, he's got to be here. There he is. There he is. There he comes. Now the prisoner uh, wearing a white spider has changed from his t-shirt. Officer, triangle water is there. Officer, triangle water is there. Lee
Lee Harvey Oswald was mortally wounded as he lay in the police booking office. Police quickly hustled Jack Ruby, the man who fired the shot, into the jail elevator. An ambulance was summoned from outside. And at the county courthouse, Tom Perriman waited in vain. On Sunday morning, we finally got word that a shooting had occurred at City Hall. Oswald had been shot. All the reporters seemed to bolt at the same time for their cars nearby. The people across the street, about 1,000 of them, got the word a few seconds later. And as they got that word, we heard a cheer go up in the background as we drove off. Harvey Oswald came to Parkland Hospital to die less than three days after President John Fitzgerald Kennedy expired there. The nation and the world mourned the death of President Kennedy. Sympathy for his widow was in every heart. Then, as now, the sudden and violent death of so vibrant a man makes no sense. The man who died, and in doing so made possible the quick apprehension of the assassin, was mourned throughout the land also. Patrolman J.D. Tippett, who died bravely in the line of duty. But in Fort Worth, Texas, another funeral took place. Here, the newsmen on assignment to cover the brief ceremony served as pallbearers. There was no one else. A weekend like no other in history. We asked Eric Johnson, who greeted President Kennedy a year ago today, and who now serves Dallas as its mayor, to comment in retrospect. A year ago today, people around the world were shocked by the tragic deaths of President Kennedy. We here in Dallas, uh, who were so close to it, uh, were perhaps shocked most of all. Uh, I think Two, the people in Washington had this same kind of effect because uh, they were, if anything, closer to the president, president than uh, anyone else. But we were here where this thing happened, and uh, of course, it, uh, after we recovered from the immediate shock a little, it forced a certain pattern of self-examination to see what we could do to avoid any possible recurrence of this kind of thing in the future. Logically, it seemed to me then, and it does now, uh, that our effort should be to build our city, uh, not necessarily into a bigger one, but always into a better one, to produce those elements of background education, of uh, training, of discipline, of straightforward uh, looking at the future as, as, as a goal to be achieved at high level throughout our uh, efforts, that this sort of pattern developing would inhibit uh, any future event of the kind that we had just experienced. Certainly, in retrospect, we know that uh, the event was not one that was in any way connected with Dallas and its atmosphere. It was the act of one who had not lived here but had moved in uh, to take a very humble job for some two months prior to November 22nd. He was a known uh, communist and uh, one who obviously had a warped mind. Dallas isn't like that. Uh, people here have balance, and uh, they are the kind of folks who raise families, uh, want them to have better opportunities, all those things that uh, American families consider to be a better way of life and a, a broad uh, concept of, 
uh, what uh, better people should be. Now, this is the overall concept of America, that uh, performance standards are what count, that uh, no matter what uh, color your skin pigmentation, you have the equal opportunity, that inherited, inherited privilege is at a minimum. We believe these things. Uh, we try to make them come true. I think in my 30 years here, that's the way I've felt about our city. It's that kind of a place. It's good to its people, and its people uh, do those things that we can, of which we can justly be proud in, in the main. In many ways, the story of that weekend a year ago is a tragic story, but it's also an account of strength strength of a nation whose continuity of government has been built on such solid principles that it can withstand such a sudden and tragic loss. The President of the United States. All I have, I would have given gladly not to be standing here today. The greatest leader of our time has been struck down by the foulest deed of our time. Today, John Fitzgerald Kennedy lives on in the immortal words and works that he left behind. He lives on in the mind and memories of mankind. He lives on in the hearts of his countrymen. No words are sad enough to express our sense of loss. No words are strong enough to express our determination to continue the forward thrust of America that he began. Just a year ago today, the first flowers appeared at the triple underpass. Today, those flowers still appear. A symbol of remembrance for a president of the United States who, too young to die, nevertheless died here just a year ago today. The story you've just seen is not one written in the many books that have been published. It's a story that's been told by the men who lived it. Nowhere are the memories of that fateful weekend more vivid or more poignant than in the minds of the newsmen who pulled themselves out of the shock of a major tragedy to supply the world with the news. Just a year ago today.